I am so honored and proud standing here and introducing one of the one of my favorite people in Johnson. I'm introducing Professor Oli Chefetz. So we'll start with a little bit of uh, Oli's biography. So some of you may or may not know, Oli actually holds a BA in physics and philosophy, <laughs> not econ, <laughs> from the Tel Aviv University. Then he uh, graduated from a PhD program in Princeton, respect, <laughs> and he celebrated his 10th anniversary with Johnson last year. Great good things that change the world 
for the day. That's quite a task. I try to nudge you in what I think is the right direction. I try to do my best during these 15 Andy Warhol minutes that I've been given, but I apologize in advance if during my talk I lose some of you. I know I've lost some of you in the past. <laughs> <laughs> I know it from your evaluations. <laughs> Just last week I was asked by a student to go through past student evaluations and pick a few mean ones. I found one where, in answer to a request for feedback that might help improve the professor's teaching effectiveness, a past student wrote the following beautifully simple advice. I wish the professor would say less nonsense. <laughs> so some of you may feel the same at the end of my talk today. I apologize in advance. My talk will proceed as follows. First, I'll remind us all how fortunate we are. Then I'll share my personal frustration that I'm sure many of you share at not doing more for others. Then I'll end with a story. It's a story that my college professor told me about Mencius, the Chinese sage who lived more than 2,000 years ago. Clearly it wasn't the physical professor. <laughs> Uh, the message from that story, at least that's my own personal interpretation, sorry Mencius if I misunderstood, is that when we fall back to the easy, lazy option of living our own comfortable lives and not really thinking about those others not as lucky as we are, we effectively are depriving ourselves of something. Now to be clear, this is not a message of sacrifice. I'm not here to tell you to give anything away, Perhaps you should, perhaps we all should, but that's not the topic today. It's more about generously sharing what we have so we can truly enjoy it ourselves. So let me start with something I tell my students every year in the last few minutes of the last class of the semester. Maybe that's why you invited me come to think of this. Somebody liked what I said in the last few minutes of the last class of the semester. So here I repeat it. I always tell my students on the last class that I consider myself very lucky to be a professor here, and that I hope my students, you, consider yourselves similarly lucky to have been given this great, rare opportunity to be students here. To take one, two, three years of your lives and come here and have this wealth of access to resources, teachers, colleagues, Look around you. Your classmates are among the brightest. You all came here from all over the world. These are now your friends for life. Some of them, I suppose. I hope. <laughs> you guys have been given access to resources, knowledge, people, that most of the rest of humanity, the seven point something billion people out there, can only dream about. And I tell my students every year that this puts great responsibility on all of us. We have no excuse not to ask ourselves every day when we wake up in the morning how to improve just a tiny bit the lives of those, the lives of those less fortunate than us. Now I know it's sometimes hard to remember how fortunate we are. We don't always get the job we wanted that grant, fellowship, internship, promotion, raise. We have other frustrations in career, relationships, family. But hey, we're mostly healthy, those of us who are. You guys are young. We have access to clean water, healthy food, a wealth of information at the tip of our fingers, social connections, belief in ourselves. We are free from persecution and we enjoy a long list of freedoms that are not enjoyed sometimes by even those who live just a few miles away, who perhaps, who perhaps have a different skin color, a different faith, perhaps speak a different language, went to different schools growing up, don't have the access. 
It's true here, and it's true in many other places around the world. Even though many of us have faced, and still face, many difficulties, discrimination for one, the fact that we're here today means, on the whole, that we're very lucky. Look at how great things are for us. You young people can decide what you want your life to look like, and what difference you want to make in the lives of others, and simply go achieve that. Nothing stops you. Changing the world can be in small, mundane ways. My colleagues and I are teachers and researchers. That's the route we took. That's what we're good at, hopefully. <laughs> we usually do research, trying to improve our knowledge of the world, and teach, trying to pass that knowledge on to others, to you. We don't usually start big revolutions. Small ones, sure, all the time. The ones you never hear about or care about. We constantly think about the content of our product. In our case, it's interaction with you, which is the service we provide to society. What we study, explore, investigate, what we teach, what's the message we convey, what implicit assumptions we make and teach you to make. That's us, researchers and teachers. In your case, Think about the content and implicit messages of what you do. The broader impact of the products you devise as entrepreneurs and engineers, market as brand managers, manage as managers and consultants, etc. Whether in IT, finance, consumer products, in small mundane ways. What impact your actions have on your employees' lives, on your customers' lives, on the broader community? on the world. Remember, in a few days you're going to be an alum of this great school and university, and your role will change from a student, which is more of a learner, to more of a doer. Your decisions will have impact on others. So that was the main thing I wanted to say. Hopefully you're convinced. I met my college philosophy professor, Yoav Ariel, a few weeks ago, and repeated this message to him. He liked it. He said he was going to say it to his own students. But that was an awkward moment for me, because here I am, his own college student from 20 years ago. Do I know enough about less fortunate than me? Do I even think about those things when I wake up in the morning? When my young kids wake me up in the morning, to be exact. <laughs> How close do I get to living up to my own standards, to what I preach to my students? In other words, it's very nice that I end the semester every year saying these things. By now I've said them enough times that I think I manage to convey the message. But saying it is the easy part. Saying it is not enough. It feels wrong to say it every year if one then immediately forgets about it and moves on. Like all of you, I too come from a great country with great, great problems. I've always struggled with the question of what I can do to improve things. At some point, I told myself that I'll go to graduate school at a good American university, and then, finally, I could fix the world's problems. But here I am, however many years later, my country and the world still suffer from many of the same old problems, and I'm still looking for my role in all of this. I shared all this with my college professor, and he reminded me of a story about Mencius. <coughs> Mencius, the Confucian Chinese sage who lived in the third century before, that is minus three, was traveling around the kingdom, talking to rulers and urging them to improve their ways. In a way, like us, university professors, trying to inspire our students to create a better world. I wonder if our situation is better than the commences, because we catch you a moment before you become rulers. Once you become rulers, it's a lost cause. You don't listen to us anymore. <laughs> 
Anyway, in Mencius Book 1, Part A, Mencius goes to see King Hui of Yang. In one of the dialogues between the two, the king is standing over a pond, I'm assuming in his royal garden, looking at the geese and deer. So beautiful and relaxing. So much wealth around, and it's all the king's. Can such things be enjoyed, the king asked the sage, also by virtuous people? Could the virtuous king, he who wants to be good, also enjoy such wealth? The sage responds that such things can be enjoyed only by virtuous people. Without virtue, one cannot enjoy these things even if one owns them. The sage effectively asks the king, have you opened your beautiful gardens to the people to enjoy? Have you shared the wealth? In our case, have we shared the knowledge, the access, the resources, the fruits of the knowledge and access and resources? The view of the geese and deer, the beautiful landscape, is not diminished by sharing it. It's enhanced. The sharing of the knowledge does not reduce it. In fact, it amplifies it. Hoarding this wealth depreciates them. We cannot fully appreciate them hoarding. Until we have shared them, says the sage, we haven't really enjoyed them ourselves. Thank you.